We back. We back. Chateau Arborescence. Is that it? I think that's it. I'm doing a little <laughs> bit better, but, you know, trying to get those French, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Accents. Accents. Or, yeah. Yes. Trying to, trying to get those a little bit more dialed in. Yeah. Well, I'm not the guy to check with, so I don't know. I don't know where you're at on that spectrum. That's a good point. We we both call croissants, croissants. Yeah, <laughs> croissant, croissant. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Welcome back, Le Chateau de Arrescence. Yeah, it's good to see you, Dunny. We're on the heels of that Neil episode. Oh, that was great. Yeah. Such good stories. Good guy. Yeah. Hi. I'm I'm excited that we got a little bit of response about old Shaky Drakes. Shaky Drakes. Yeah, that was a big thing. You know, I think we mentioned this in the episode, right? Is that we ended up talking with Neil for like another hour. Yeah. If we got a little more insight into Shaky Drakes. <laughs> and then uh, just kind of happen chance, we've collected a little bit more data about Shaky Drakes. People we learned that this was out. a spot. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, we collected a little bit of data that suggested that they didn't used to really card anyone back in the day. So in the late 70s, Ooh. it sounded like a come one, come all sort of situation. <laughs> so if you want to be a, an underage person and collect yourself some booze, Shaky, Shaky Drakes, Drakes was the joint. That was your jam. That was the jam. So, I, you know, what I see for us is this emerging picture of this place in the seedy underbelly of Flag in the, what, 70s, 80s? Is that, Yeah, I don't know when it opened, but Neil was referenced in the mid 80s. These yeah. other stories, do you know what? Late 70s. Late 70s. Late 70s, I think, is what we what we learned. So we're looking at like a five to a ten year span here. Yeah. So for our listeners, Dan and I are clearly doing our best to just, you know, journalistically and so methodically put this stuff together, right? <laughs> yeah. We're looking for more data. We got we got like one of those cork boards with uh string. All the yarn going towards <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so we're trying to find out who's at the top of Shaky Drake's here. <laughs> Shaky Drake's. Yeah. Um, so please actually, this is a sincere invitation. If you have any personal experiences with Shaky Drake's or if you know of others and have heard anecdotes yeah. about Shaky Drake's please reach out to us please hit us up you can hit us up on the gram you can find us on the interwebs yeah our it's website yeah we got those security Twitter. emails yeah. just anything just hit us up with just them please. shaky drake stories yes no doubt all right well on the docket today we got uh we're going to discuss epigenetics Ooh, yeah that's and a big one it is it's a big one and we kind of dip into intergenerational trauma yeah. which relates to epigenetics, but okay. I think there's much more that we could discuss there. Anyway, so um, we're going to talk about how epigenetics broadly affects our day-to-day lives. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, how it affects our ancestors and our descendants. Okay. So, yeah, are your descendants doomed by your genetics? Well, um, I guess it, de- it depends on how you define doomed, <laughs> but they might be set up for some uh, good and bad things. Yeah. Some good things, right? Some they, good things. They're yeah. gonna really thrive. They might really thrive. Yeah, like like uh, your enjoyment of Ted Lasso probably has changed your genes in yeah. a way that's gonna positively influence their lives. Yeah, they'll I be think, more sensitive to humor. Yeah, that is like a very relevant uh, and timely experience these days. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's kind of define epigenetics. Man, you know I love that dictionary. Yeah. So we go to Oxford for this one, right? Yeah. And what Oxford's telling us is that epigenetics involves changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. Yeah. Right? Whoa. Whoa. Getting them. Whoa. That's big. So there's this key word in there that's expression to me. Sounds important. Yeah. Like how genes are expressed. So so mm-hmm. basically epi, 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 epi pen, <laughs> like the prefix to that is uh it's a word that means on top of or in addition to it means over outside around and and so what it's saying is basically the things that go on on top of or around your genes have an influence on your genes so environmental factors socialization those things all have an influence on what genes are triggered to be expressed or what genes are activated Mm -hmm. maybe what genes are not activated which then influences the way that DNA plays out for the person. So this kind of takes me into the cell itself, yeah. right? Yeah, the cell. I was thinking, how many genes are in a cell? <laughs> is this like a joke? No, no, this is like literally, I think it's more than one, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Uh, how many genes are in a cell? It's got to be more than one pair. 
Yeah. It's yeah. like 22,000. Oh my gosh. So there's like 22,000 roughly mm-hmm. in, in humans. There's roughly 22,000 genes in the cell. Um, and so only a small portion of that 22,000 number are actually active at any given time. Mm. And so the way that you engage the world and experience the world it has an influence on which ones are activated. And yeah, we're going to learn more about how broadly that is and what that means for you and others in your life. There's a, a researcher, Steve Cole, um, at the U- UCLA. He says basically a cell is a machine for turning experience into biology. Ooh. Yeah. So that's basically epigenetics. Your experiences yeah. become part of your biological process. Mm. Yeah, and so genes coupled with gene expression inform the characteristics, you know, physical, psychological, and otherwise that an individual demonstrates. Blammo. Blammo. Yeah. So we got some studies okay. to go through with yeah. this. What would a quick and nerdy be without some studies? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love me. I love me them studies. Show me them studies. Show me them. So the first one is with bees. Bees? Yeah. And I wanted to go into this study because I had I had an interaction with what I believe is one of the species of bees that was in this study. Okay. So in this study, it, it was uh, done by a man named Gene Robinson. Okay. And uh, he took two species of bees. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So this is a guy named Gene studying bees' genes? Yeah. <laughs> so this is Gene studying bees' yeah. genes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You need to figure out one of those Ted Lasso riddles. What if... What if this gene was studying the joint on the leg of a bee? The, oh, it's gene studying the genes of the genes? Yeah, gene studying the bee's knees? <laughs> the bee's knees. I was way off. It's a gene studying the bee's genes? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, yes, there it is. There I was expecting crickets. I think you hit the wrong one. <laughs> the people love it. <laughs> There it is. There it is. That's what I expected. Yeah. So, <laughs> All right, tell us about Gene. So Gene, he takes these two species of bees. One is the, and here we go with, uh, yeah, please forgive us for our mispronunciation. Um, the Apis melferia linguistica. Okay. Or Ligustic. Is that a European yeah. honeybee? That is. Yeah. That's good for you, man. <laughs> yeah, man. I know that. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. That's a European honeybee. I love a honeybee. And okay. the other type of bee mm-hmm. that he studied was the Apis mellifera scutellata. Scutellata. Ooh. Sounds like an African killer bee. Man, you... Yeah. Yeah, you've been... You, you're down with your bees. I know my species, les bees. <laughs> you are the bees' knees with them bees' species. <laughs> I'm the bees' knees with the bees' species. Studied by Gene. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, and so basically these two bees, they're actually really similar, yep. except they demonstrate these very different behaviors. So okay. um, the European honeybee tends to have a less aggressive, more copacetic uh, behavioral pattern. So if they're attacked, they're actually much less aggressive to respond to attack. Um, they're much less aggressive to initiate an attack. Um, just different in that way. Okay. The African killer bees, not so much. Like a little more mean. Yeah. This is the one I'm worried I encountered a few weeks ago. Wait, what? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Tell me them. So, so my kids come inside and they're like, yeah, there's a beehive in the backyard. Yeah. It's like, well, you came to the right guy. Yeah. Let me go get the hose. (laughs) so, 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 you know where I went, but, uh. You know, I don't know that. Well, I'd mm-hmm. recommend to anyone the hose is not the wisest idea. Yeah. So, <laughs> wait, you use the hose? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I literally did. I didn't have anything. I didn't have access to anything else. We were having people over like yeah. within an hour's time. So I was like, what's my meter resource to uh, take care of this hive yeah. and prevent injury mm-hmm. from stings? Which I love bees. Love bees. And our planet obviously is suffering from impacts to bee species and we need more of them. So I don't in- encourage harming bees otherwise, yep. uh, except for the safety of people. Okay. So uh, disclaimer. Yeah. So yeah. all I got, uh, all I got in my toolbox is uh, is a hose at this point. I don't okay. have access to anything else. Just a garden hose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Here we go. So my son, <laughs> my son says to me, yeah, "If you spray them, they're gonna come sting you." Yeah. And I. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. And say, oh, foolish son. Foolish son. <laughs> okay, let's go. Wise dad. Wise dad. Knows here. what he's doing. I'll spray these bees. I'll, I'll just, just leave. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just stand a ways back. Yeah. And then casually walk away. They won't know who inflicted that harm. Yep. They'll just think it's a rainstorm or something, like a heavy rainstorm. <laughs> From a very concentrated area. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. They'll go attack okay. the clouds. Yeah. They're not going to attack me. Yeah. So, so. I see where this is going. Yeah, so I, my kids run in the house and shut the door. Mm-hmm. Smart. <laughs> yep. Smart. Turns out it must have been the African killer bees because I sprayed the hive and immediately, immediately had bees like swarming you. Dude, all I paid over. money for a video of this. Landing all over me. Yep. I got stung a handful of times Yeah, um, and had to just like, you know, tough it out and act like nothing because just all these welts. <laughs> yeah. Like the first thought that comes to my, mind, to my mind is like, not sure what you expected. <laughs> yeah. like you thought these uh it sounds like we made an error in our assessment and we thought these were some malefera linguisticas yeah yeah turns i thought out these were some, the linguisticas and these are some scu- sculatadas <laughs> yeah, yeah it turns out <laughs> these are some Nutella my species. if i would have had you there oh dude i would have been able to know if there's one thing i know it's a good bee yeah yeah you would have been able to tell me oh those are sculatadas yeah those are sculatadas and the thing you don't want to do is get a hose <laughs> yeah. that's not the that's not the answer here that's not the jam yeah so, um, so Gene, he's studying these two yeah. types of bees. And what he does is they create these two hives and they have, all, all, you know, the trays of the different. So they have trays in each hive that have, you know, that same type of bee on each tray. So they pu- he pulls out one tray of each type and then um, he paints the backs of that one tray and these are this is a tray of young bees within each hive um so they're really young like similar to like what would either be infancy or childhood in our time span and um he paints their backs how i don't know i'm like still very careful that question (laughs) very carefully yeah (laughs) come on come on come on so he uh paints their backs And he sticks them in the other hive. And this is what Gene Robinson knows at this point. This is, um, at this point, he understands, based on other research, that epigenetics occurs. Um, That basically his theory and his hypothesis going into this is that when he switches the trays, that those young bees will be adopted by the new hive. They'll begin to resemble the behavior of the hive they're fostered into. So the less aggressive ones will actually resemble the more aggressive behavior Mm. and vice versa. Um, And he's wondering to what extent this all occurs. So he he goes into it kind of thinking this is going to happen. So he uh, he swaps the trays and then they observe the bees and even the bees with the painted backs, they begin to represent the behavior. So they have these different tests where they aggravate the hive. I don't know if they sprayed a hose I don't know probably not what, a, what their probably methodology not. Yeah. was for aggravating the hive, but they would aggravate it and then they would observe what the bees would do. Mm. And yeah, the bees with the painted backs who were previously more aggressive became less aggressive. They were less aggressive in their mm-hmm. behavior and then vice versa. The ones that had been less aggressive, but adopted into the aggressive hive became more aggressive. Yeah. So he observed it in their behavior, but that his, he's studying genes. So it's not something observable outside. So he takes this vacuum and he begins, well, he has his homies take this vacuum and suck up the bees in the tray. Um, the bees with the painted backs and he sucks them into this chamber and it has, um, liquid nitrogen in the chamber. And so it freezes the bees instantly. And the idea behind that is is pretty aggressive. So uh, at first I thought Gene really loved bees. Maybe, maybe not so much. Yeah. He might've got some sick jollies out of this process. (laughs) I don't don't know. Okay. If if you could give him a call, that'd be great. Okay. So, um, so it freezes the bees and the benefit to that is it keeps their cell structure pretty much identical to what it was at the moment that happens. And so at that point, then he takes the cells of the bees, takes the bees, and he he can extract the brain material, and then he grinds that up, and then you can put it into a DNA microarray machine, and 
you can then sequence or you can get the DNA and the genes within the cells. And so within the cells, he actually saw that there were cell changes. What he found was that the changes were far more encompassing than he first anticipated. And the reason that the impact was so far more encompassing was because of what's referred to as transcription genes or genes that essentially have, they affect how other genes are read or expressed. And so there's like a cascading effect essentially. Mm. So the, the amount of genes affected were far more than what he anticipated, meaning that the way those bees behaved, what, what was seen in their behavior was had had a substantial biological basis they were then triggered to act the way that they learned to act yeah so so let's do it in a nutshell right so like uh, gene he's looking at he's looking at these bees and his <laughs> hypothesis yeah. is like i want to identify which genes were influenced by being placed in the environment that's different from yeah. the one that they were mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's natural to them right and then so they do this whole thing mm -hmm. and he finds that there's massive biological changes in the mm -hmm. bees' brains, just mm -hmm. from the environment that they mm -hmm. were in, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, far more, far more encompassing than he thought. Yeah, wow, much broader than he thought, and it's because of transcription genes then informed how other genes were written, okay. which just led to a much bigger influence than he anticipated. So, okay. it basically, his hypothesis is accurate. The degree to which genes were changed really, really yeah. threw him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the image that comes to my mind is almost like dominoes. Like this, yeah. these transcription genes then have this effect that's like dominoes yeah, that sends yeah, it down yeah, the line yeah. sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. A cascading effect. A cascading effect. Ooh, yeah. okay. You may think, well, that's just bees. Bees just experience that. Well, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> what about hominids? Hominids? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you spray them with hoses or, or what? Yeah. What about hominids with hoses spraying bees? Yeah. Well, there was this yeah. study okay. where they sucked humans up in vacuums, painted their backs, <laughs> put them in a nitro liquid nitrogen chamber. Okay. Now, but for humans, yeah, increasingly more studies are exploring the degree to which genes are influenced by env environmental factors. So um, uh, some, some of the most robust studies involve socialization or mm. there are some even studies that focus on um, the effect of socioeconomic status and how that can be represented in genes. Yeah. Um, so maybe one such example involves like having social support networks and, this, and the strength of the immune system. Essentially, several studies have shown that uh, the strength of someone's social network um, influences or can be correlated with the immune response. Um, and that's regardless of similarities in biology, race, gender, age, any of those things. So individuals who are going through similar diseases or disorder, who have similarities in terms of other biological factors that are significant, can experience a, a wide range of response in their immune system, likely because of the gene expression and then um, there's this correlation between those who have strong social support networks, they have a stronger immune system. And they've even learned how to study the mechanism for this on a biological level. So uh, one, like a, a really good example of this then is there were these kids, they took these kids in the study that had low socioeconomic status and they experienced far more disease and disorder um, and that was quantifiable. Like you could just, yeah. there were, there were more illness, higher rates of illness, mm -hmm. um, based on socioeconomic status. And so one study, this was with Steve Cole, uh, the researcher I referenced earlier and Gregory Miller and Edith Chen, and they wanted to understand the mechanism in more detail. So essentially what they did is, um, they took these children and they, they took children that were in lower socioeconomic status and some that were in higher and then they had them watch these social exchanges between people they would have these they would have all the kids rate um, how threatening the situation was amongst other things and the kids in the lower socioeconomic status often uh, rated well significant to a significant significant degree rated the situations as more threatening 
And because they experienced them as more threatening, they then went into the genes and could see that there were different ways their genes were expressed that triggered more of a fear response. And so yeah. it wasn't it wasn't something that was like socially learned. Biologically, experiences would literally be more threatening to them. Yeah. Um, and they'd be triggered in that way. And when, when someone experiences more persistent or more frequent ex- uh, moments where they're in that state of feeling threatened, mm-hmm. it, it compromises your immune system. And that is what they believe becomes the mechanism for why there's this correlate between the rate of disease and disorder amongst something like socioeconomic status. Yeah. Yeah. Like in my mind that has profound implications for, I don't know, I just think even psychological treatment and how like, um, how, how society is structured. Right. So it seems the way that you're describing it is like these genes have been turned on as a result of being in lower SES conditions. And then that literally these situations, um, uh, interactions are perceived as more threatening. Yeah. And they're literally that. It's not just like, oh, that's your idea. Yeah. Oh, it, then it induces the biological response to respond to threat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that compromises your immune system. It requires energy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, your body becomes weaker because yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah, and it was interesting to hear you mention also with immuno responses that people with stronger support social networks and support groups seem to have a stronger immune mm-hmm, response as mm-hmm, well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so the, some of those things I often think on a psychological sense, they, they make common sense. Like it makes sense why someone yeah. with a social support network, maybe those people show up and offer more help or just, you know, it feels good. And there's then a biological response to feeling good if someone checks in on you. Yeah. Um, so those things are obvious, but what they're saying here is literally within your genes over time, your genes, uh, can, can be accustomed to firing in certain ways that yeah. affect your susceptibility to that environmental experience. Yeah. And then do you see, well, I'm thinking what fires together, wires together. And the more that that's happening repetitiously, the more that that becomes a default. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, not to be a big bummer, we're kind of on the downside of this. I mean, it, it relates to positive characteristics mm-hmm. as well as ones that are less comfortable and less less yeah. positive. Yeah. Um, but this happens intergenerationally. <laughs> so, yeah. so even further, w- yeah. I'm thinking coming full circle when you're asking me if my kids are doomed. <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. Here we are. We're at the intergenerational part of it. Yeah. yeah. And so if those kids in that study... If their genes are expressing a certain way, there's now evidence to suggest, or for for decades, just which is recent in science, right? Mm-hmm. But within the last couple of decades, there's evidence for ways in which th- th- that pattern of gene expression is then passed on genetically. Yeah. And so that child, regardless, let's say that kid no longer experience, grows up, reaches middle class, middle to upper class even, mm-hmm doesn't experience those threats, maybe even has an evolution in their own genetic expression to where they don't even perceive threats anymore. Though if, if they have a child, when the genes were being expressed that way, there's a chance that's passed on and that child will be more yeah. susceptible to perceiving situations as threatening. Yeah. Do you, and then do you know how many generations that spans typically? We do. Yeah. So <laughs> all this is, oh man, this stuff is, I love this stuff. Yeah. So there's a couple of studies that show show this and so if we can begin with animals again okay i like starting with animals yeah Yeah. what animal are you most like um well chinchilla (laughs) that's right the chinchilla so these studies involve the cousin your your cousins the mice oh mice you're trying to call me a mice i thought you were gonna say there's some sort of like uh squirrel rat beaver mix (laughs) a monkey chinchilla (laughs) a minchilla a minchilla (laughs) yeah So with mice, there's all this evidence to show how they've shown it with um, responses to fear or trauma, responses to depression. They actually show it to go three to four generations down. One one common study referenced is where uh, they took these mice and they and they gave them the pleasant scent of a cherry blossom. Mm, Yeah, that's nice. So these mice at first, that's that's the life, right? They're in this study. Yeah, it's they, nice for the they, mice. They just get these uh, episodic uh, moments of smelling that pleasant smell. Yeah. Probably produces dopamine. Probably feels real good to them. Yeah, nice and relaxing. Yeah. yeah. And then what do the scientists do? 
probably involves some sort of electricity. <laughs> yeah, they pair it with a shock. Oh my gosh. So they classically condition them yep. to learn that that smell is equated with a shock. Okay. And they can, they can see that it affects uh, the flow of cortisol. They can see how the genes are expressed. They, they begin to measure what that shock creates and then ultimately what that smell creates in the mice. Okay. Those same influences, like how cortisol is released or how the genes are expressed, are seen three to four generations down in the mice, even if the younger mice do not experience any of the pairing with the cherry blossom. Wow. When they okay. introduce the scent like three generations down, yeah. it will create the same response. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I, w- I want to see if I'm thinking about this correctly. Yeah, yeah. So I want to use the bees example again. Yeah, so yeah. with the with the linguisticas and the uh, Nutellas, right? If yeah. we switch their <laughs> if we switch their hives, and then you're saying their brains, <laughs> their genes actually changed, right? Yeah. If if gene was to then research the offspring of those yeah. bees. Mm-hmm most likely mm-hmm. those changes would have been observed in the offspring as well. Yeah. 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 So it's it, passing itself down. Yeah. Yep. Not even most likely like this happens. It yeah. just happens. Um, to what degree there may be some subtle variation and that would depend on the individual's biology and their environment. It's just yeah. so profound how we're connected to our environment, yeah. how we're connected intergenerationally. And then, um, so it'd be, Hard to say definitively to what degree or range mm-hmm. the effect occurs, but it does. Yeah, it it's just there. absolutely does. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, this then can be seen in humans as well. There's evidence for how uh, like cortisol is released. Like they looked at um, survivors of the Holocaust, children mm. of survivors of the Holocaust. So children that were born after someone had survived being um, in a concentration camp or in the Holocaust, children that were born at or near the World Trade Center Mm -hmm. near September 11th, um, but born afterwards, Mm -hmm. um, children of war veterans, where the war war veteran went to war and came back and then had their child. So um, they can see that the way the genes are expressed, there are similarities in the parents and the children, regardless Mm -hmm. of the child, uh, experiencing that particular stimulus or not yeah so very observed changes in the very biology yeah. what, even independent of ever being exposed to that event yeah it's again passed down and it's there yeah so essentially um that the, the current hypothesis is that this happens in two ways okay one is that potentially it is learned that the parent the mother or the father actually their behavior is changed by their gene expression, which influences the way they either connect to or relate to the child, which then the child experiences. Mm. Um, So if a parent experiences PTSD and is limited in how they can connect with that child, Mm. that may then influence the child's own gene expression Mm -hmm. because um, they're dealing with a direct stimulus of a parent that may be less connected. Yeah. But further than that, they also believe just hereditarily the genes can be passed down biologically. So even if the parent has worked through that and is able to connect, the child can still represent similar patterns of gene expression, which may influence something like cortisol or hormone release or just infinitely an infinite range of things. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm also thinking back to that like threat perception kind of thing. Um, seems that like that that can be passed down in a way as well. And mm-hmm. both of those hypotheses seem like it's not an either or. Mm-hmm. It seems like those things can both be true there. Yeah, yeah, and probably com- a compounding effect, right? Yeah. They probably play off one another. That's what I would think. So the person who has inherited that gene and yeah. then is also exposed to an environment that's like uh, maybe low on the connection spectrum yeah. is going to be more profound in how they yeah. maybe experience fear or whatever that yeah. might be. yeah. So you were mentioning, you and I were chatting about this and you were saying, yeah, so this, this influences like intergenerational trauma, Mm. maybe racial trauma, um, other types of trauma that occur systematically or socially. And yeah, for sure. I think we'd need to like dedicate a whole episode to that. Um, to talk about that. So this may be something to put on the horizon. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, um, this, for me, right, would have profound or really large implications for environmental justice. And yes. so we want to create environments or systems and societies that are um, equitable in the way in which they treat people. Yeah. And so if people are lower on that spectrum, it's going to create more problems for them, which are then passed down, right? And yeah. so in my mind, yeah, I'm thinking there's definitely some uh, 
opportunity or time that could be given to oh, that for idea. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it may be good to, and I kind of geeked out and dominated talking about the studies. It may be good just to like quick take home bullet points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So could we wrap these like back and forth? Yeah. A little, uh, take Table home tennis. tennis. Yeah. A little THT. <laughs> take home tennis. All right. Yeah. So first of all, we, we, we now understand that gene expression is altered daily by our socialization and our experiences with the world around us. Okay. So what that means is, uh, get yourself into some healthy groups, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Healthy groups and also just healthy environments. Healthy environments. So it's not specifically just with socialization. It's like literally your contact with the world yeah. around you. The space that you are in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The space that you take up. Yeah. You know, the next one, uh, they'll take home gene expression can be altered within minutes and can cover large swaths of genes and can be lasting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 it's cascading, right? Because of those transcription genes, yeah. those dominoes. Yeah. And then g- changes in gene expression can affect our offspring and our genes are affected by our ancestors. Mm. <laughs> so it's all interconnected, not only in the space continuum of the mm. world around us, but in the time continuum of before and after. Yeah, yeah. what's that called, Beard? That uh, Space-time continuum. Space-time continuum, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then lastly, a good take home, uh, intergenerational influences occur through both men and women. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I wanted to finish off with a quote from that researcher I re- referenced a couple of times. His name is Steve Cole. Um, and he's quoted as saying, your experiences today will influence the molecular composition of your body for the next two to three months or perhaps for the rest of your life. And we also know it to be for the rest of the lives of those after you. So plan your day accordingly. Wow. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. That, that does speak to the power of intention for me. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Live, live your day in spaces and with people that uh, help those genes to be expressed in ways that are going to benefit your descendants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good stuff, Dunny. Thanks. Yeah. Well, why don't you take us out by shouting us out? No doubt. Uh, you can always find us on the interwebs at www.beyondflag.com, flag spelled. F-L-G. And we're always on that Twitter feeds and that Instagram <laughs> feeds sometimes. So kind feel of. free to find us there. <laughs> Beyond underscore flag, also spelled F-L-G. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime. Take care. Love you.